Just a question. For, can I just kind of sit? I don't want to sit and look dumb and not say anything. You're not dumb because we're rolling. It's <laughs> <laughs> the best way. This is wonderful. My, wow. Well, you're at this. We're here with the Method Actor Speaks, and boy, are we lucky today. Oh, my God. How does it taste? The, the Yorkies, I get them, from, they're from Italy, but... Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. And people don't realize what Yorkies are, I mean. You know, it's filling, too. Very oh, it's easy. amazing. Yeah. Would you describe again what they are? Well, it's like a potato ravioli. It's, it's potato dough. Dough. Wow. But the homemade ones were the best, because then your grandmother would put... The cheese in there, and this ingredient, that ingredient. I, I used to eat at Dom De Luisa's mother's house. Oh, really? And Dom was an incredible cook. So we played brothers uh -huh. on the Sherry Lewis show. Yeah. So, at the, the first time I went up to his mother's house, I was still powerlifting. So I was up, to, I was wrestling. No, no, powerlifting, and I was up to two between two fifty and two hundred and sixty pounds. I walk in the door, and she loved me. She says, oh, manja, feel me, oh, manja. And I'm eating. So now the next time, I had taken off like 45 pounds. Uh -huh. I come in and she goes, what happened to you? <laughs> I said, well, I had to lose some weight. Are you okay? Yeah. I, I said, believe yeah. it. She said, eat something, please. You look too thin. <laughs> <laughs> and she... Well, real. <laughs> Italian mama. Oh, she really was. Oh, she's yeah. an amazing lady. Oh, and Dom was an amazing cook. Oh, I, I enjoyed him. Oh, Dom DeLuise, yes. We're here, we're talking now with Hank. Now, Hank, you, you changed your name. <laughs> well, most Italians I know did. Well, right? Gerard. Well, how did you come up with the name Gerard? Garrett. Garrett, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, I found out that my mother and father originally from Russia. So now, I grew up with the Italians in uh -huh. home. And a cousin of mine who was the family historian, a great-great-grand... Grand, my great-great-great-grandmother was living in Russia. My great-great-grandfather was in London. He worked for the Hudson Bay Fur Company. He went to Russia to buy furs. Met my great-great-grandmother. They got married. And his name was Garrett. I never knew this. Huh. I thought I took my name from Betty Garrett. Oh. I'm... Because, as you know, if you had an ethnic name, yes. you couldn't work in New York. So, like, you know... Bruce Kirby and all of them. Oh, yeah. Ex oh, you know Bruce. Oh, we did it in my first film. I did my first play at the Actors Studio. Mike Gazzo wrote the play, The October 90 Tommy Zero. His son was my godson. Ah. Oh. Yeah, what a shame we lost him. Yeah, he went quick, thank God. When we were doing Car 54, Bruce was on it, you know, he was a regular on the show as well. His son would walk in and he'd sit in my lap. I swear to God, he was about five or six years old. Bright, sharp. So he'd look at the script, and he'd say, Uncle Hank, what is M-O-S? I says, well, because they were German directors years ago in film, it meant mid-out sound. He said, can't they just say silent? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little baby telling me. <laughs> and uh, what's C-U? I said, that means close-up. And, but it says ECU. I said, that's extreme close-up. He says, couldn't they just say near? <laughs> What's he doing now? He's no, gone. he passed away. That was the one who died. Yeah, yeah. Bruno. Yeah. That's his father's name. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, Bruce. Uh, Bruce Kerr. Oh. Giovanni, yeah. Yeah, I did my first play with him, Mike Gazzo's play at the Actors Studio. Gadjo. Yeah, I did October Night of Tommy Zero, and uh, oh my god! Yeah, that's what got me into the studio. Really? And it, was, it had never been done. Originally, it's funny. It was called the o morning, the October morning of Tommy Zero, and Tony Sirico, who played uh, Paulie Walnuts on The Sopranos, he did it. Ah. Uh. You know, so we're the only two that ever played that part. Oh my god! 
It was it. And ladies and gentlemen, we're sitting here with, with his very close friend and manager, D.M. Smith. <laughs> ah, and I'm really glad you come to eat. You got a great <laughs> smile. Now, how did you two come Thank about? You, well, I met him. I was doing the publicity for a, a old, um, very old Hollywood um, organization, uh -huh. and he was performing there. So I went up to him. He was selling his CDs, which he'll tell you a little bit about. And I promised him I would buy one. And then the evening was over, and I hadn't, and I wanted to keep my word. So I found his number, and I called. And he said, no, you don't, uh, I'll give it to you. You don't have to pay for it. I thought, oh, this is looking good. So he <laughs> said, but you have to meet me. So I went over. And he was leaving the area in about a month. And I thought, well, I'll be glad to drive him around. I get my free CD. And, and I found that during that time, I asked him all these sorts of questions. And I thought, I'd like to manage you. He didn't have anyone then. So it took me three months later to get him to let me manage. Were you doing that professionally, or was no, it's this was your first client? It's my first client, and I have an unusual background. I started off as a fashion designer. Oh, you dealt with that. And worked in <laughs> London, and I would still be there, except immigration wouldn't let me stay past five years. So mm -hmm. I came back and joined uh, the corporate world, thinking I could then get back over to England and life would be the same uh -huh. as it was, and of course it never is that way. Never. So then I went to work on Wall Street, was there for seven years, and my mother died. So a long story right. to ask you how I met him. So I figured I'm out in Hollywood, or in Los Angeles, I want to live someplace that's going to be kind of exciting. So I found Hollywood. I live right in the center. Right in the center. You, you're in Hollywood or West Hollywood? I'm in Hollywood. Hollywood. Oh, okay, because I thought I saw. She's very modest. She also had a studio in New York. Ah. Had a studio here, designing. Designing, yes. I saw her, her designs. She showed me her book. My God. Most amazing stuff I ever saw. And as a guy, you know, you think, oh, okay, yeah, it's nice. But I was so impressed. I. I I remember the designs. I remember all the stuff that she had used, the ribbons and the pleats. It was fantastic. Yeah. Honest to God. And that's what I thought. He can't be serious. But he says it enough times that I really think you mean it. And I might start a men's line. Why yeah. not? Oh, that'd be good. I just had a designer on Mona Lee, is her name. And she really, she does a lot of Never wonderful name. clothes. You know, and they, yeah, she, I just did a show with her and then invited her back and she was modeling some of her clothes here. But I told her we do it Skype where she has more. But I'm very I have a few I have a few uh designers that come on the show. I mean that's a especially in this business, I mean you really the creativity that comes out of you, you know, to dress. Do you dress him at times? Not yet, but I, I wanted to tell you the reason I got him design, I, I'm a farm girl, so I never thought of ever designing, doing that sort of thing. But I met Edith Head one time, uh -huh. and I got to go to her home, and I asked her, I said, you know, I really, I, would, I won a design award, but what should I do? She said, go to UCLA. They have a design program, and that's where I went. And by that time, they'd closed the design department, so I went to another school. And so I attributed to Edith Head, who I only met once, but she was always an idol. And the funny thing is, I did a series, what brought me to California is I had a series with James Earl Jones. I was co-starring with him. And who designed my sleep, my, all my clothes? He, Edith Head. Wow. Really? Wow. And I, she looked, I was telling the Anna Marie on that. And uh, we have passed each other's crossroads so many times. She lived in Holland. I was shooting a film in Holland. Never met her. We lived a couple of blocks from each other in New York. Never met her. There was a, oh, we were at the same New Year's Eve party. <laughs> and, 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 I hadn't met her. Really? <laughs> that kind of hurts a little. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't what? even notice me. <laughs> uh, oh, I, oh, know, we, I also, noticed you, but just hadn't met you. <laughs> didn't met you. And, and also, we both lived in England. 
Yeah, and we were both living in London. Um, Tell them why you were there. I was doing, that was the week that was with David Frost. Oh. And because uh, when I was appearing at the Copacabana, I opened for Tony Bennett for four years. At the, and right. then, I, then I was with Jerry Vale for two years. But my mentor, Sid Caesar, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, I learned how to do dialectic gibberish. So there was a gentleman in the audience and from England, and he was hired to do the show. That was what that was, and he couldn't do it because he had a couple of movie commitments. So he asked me, would you be interested in going to London? And I said, doing what? He said, the show called that. That was the week that was with David Frost. But, and I, he put me in touch with a guy named Brian Brawley, who was the producer, and I called him, and I did an Italian and David Frost, I'm playing on a Italian count, and I'm doing all this, and he says, oh yeah, the bathroom is down the hall. <laughs> so I played a Chinese delivery man, I played uh, a Japanese karate instructor. So each week I played a different character. Thank huh. you, Sid. I was going to say, did this come from Sid Caesar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched him work. Uh, as a kid, I would sneak into the studio in New York and I'd climb the back stairway and go down the roof and into the studio. They never saw me. Really? Yeah. And one night, uh, they were doing running rehearsal and I, I couldn't help it. I laughed out loud and said, looked up there. He says, who the hell's up there? And they sent people up there and they, they, go, they okay. grabbed me. Wow. And he said, what are you doing up there? I said, watching you. I said, I'm such a fan of yours. He said, uh, sit down. I said, what do you want to do? I said, I'm hoping to be a comedian. I was start just starting to work the cat skills. And he said, do uh, you have an act? I said, well, you know, a few jokes that I'm doing here and there. And he said, uh, what do you like to do? I said, well, I like doing dialects, but I, I was doing Yiddish dialect, Italian. And he said, you know, he said, I do that. I said, yes, I know. He said, but I do it in gibberish. I said, oh, and I watched him work. And I caught the, you know, from my ear. And he and I had a conversation in Chinese. Neither one of us knew what the hell he was saying. Right. You know, he'd say something. We'd have an argument in Chinese, and people going, "When do these two guys speak Chinese?" I always thought it was real Italian or whatever he was doing. Oh yeah. But uh, I did that. Jerry Vale and I we worked a club, and it was a, an Indian-owned uh, club, in New York. So I see Jerry and, and Tony. Tony Bennett was in town doing a concert. So they're sitting there, and I walk over, and we're all going to have breakfast. And I walked over, and I went, Oh, ma non c'è quello cosa, ma zetta la pagina, o zubaga, o zubaga. A guy comes over and says, oh, I haven't heard Sicilian spoken since I was a kid. <laughs> and Jerry said, Don't do that again. You can see why he's so fun to work yeah. with. He's always going into voices, and I find when I really get upset about something, I say, we need to do this, and he cracks a funny, and I just forget what I was mad about. It ain't fair. <laughs> and I don't want to get him mad because I stupidly was teaching her martial arts. Martial But you've done so much. I mean, the audience should know. I mean, you're a comedian. You're a professional wrestler. Yeah. Right? And And... Also, an uh, actor. Yeah. I was thinking about you in the original cast of Car 54, and I'm thinking you must be the only one alive in the cast. <laughs> and, and a lot of the people who first watched that show are not around either. No. <laughs> yeah, when, <laughs> when you think about it, I mean that show was what over 50 years ago. Oh yeah, we did it 1961, 62. But it's had a rebirth. Oh yeah, with uh, with me TV. Yeah, oh. and people watch it. You know, sometimes at two o'clock in the morning, and suddenly people are recognizing me not from Condor, but Car Fifty Four. Right. So it was like, 
wow, when did you see it? They said, a couple of nights ago. Yeah, they, they, that's the amazing thing with cable now. I mean, all those whole new careers are coming back oh, to yes. people that never, you know, died out. And all of a sudden, because there was things you did like Absolutely. 60 years ago, 50 years ago. He's dating you, really. Well, I mean, it was done in the 60s, too. It's, you know, like Tina Louise is a good friend of mine. And that series, they, well, they didn't get residuals. Either did you. Oh. There was no residuals for that show. You know, uh, television. Uh, I had a guy come up to me and ask me if I spoke Farsi. And I said, why do you ask? He said, I, I'm from Iran. I saw you was doing movie Kandor, and you spoke Kvarsi. So I said, oh yeah, I speak every language where my movie is shown. Because it's all dub. Yeah, it's all dub, yeah. Farsi's very big in L.A. now. Oh yeah. All my doctors are speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I only have one Jewish doctor. Yeah, and he's from my feet. <laughs> All the rest, are, you know, from Farsi. I know. Oh my God. I mean, thank it, God they're good. It, it, it's like, this sauce is amazing. Oh, gravy. Okay, I'm glad you like. Thank wow. You. But I mean, you've done so much. Why? Why? You know, you came from Harlem. Yeah. How does a kid from Harlem outside of Bird Lancaster want to be an actor? Well, or comedian, whatever you, you started out to be. I was always in trouble as a kid. Uh, my mother and father were too busy to take care of me, just trying to earn a living. They were peddlers. They sold fruits and vegetables in a push cart. You right. know, a lot of people right. did that at home. So I was on the street. I was on the street, uh, actually slept in that cardboard boxes. My mother and father never even knew I was missing. They had, you know, they were so busy trying to earn a living and I, I don't blame them. So I was on the street, uh, running around with some really stupid people like myself, a couple of cowboys. And at one point, uh, I was, as I said, I was always in trouble. I was packing a gun, I was 13 years old, packing a piece, what am I mm -hmm. doing? I started in martial arts when I was 11. Uh, a guy came around, he was from Korea, his name was Min Pai. And he was giving free lessons because he wanted the adults to start paying for lessons. So he was giving the kids lessons. I went there because I wanted to be a better street fighter. I wanted to be able to knock a guy out in one shot. And that, mm. that was my goal. But I learned humility and learned respect. Well, I got in a lot of trouble, and two kids came to my school. They were from Italy. Uh, they didn't speak English. The father of the two kids and his brother were kicked out of Italy. They were in trouble. So they came illegally to the United States or in New York. Mm -hmm. My father somehow started talking to these guys. Now they got nailed and they were going to be kicked out of the United States and they couldn't go back to Italy. So my father said to them, where are you going to take these kids? We don't know. My father said, I'll take them. My father became guardian to these two boys, Vinnie and Charlie. So they were my brothers. We slept in the same bed, three of us sleeping in a single bed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so, uh, and uh, we did some stupid things together. But when they saw me, when I started karate, and they said, Hank, we want to ask you something. Why? Why are you running around in your pajamas oh, yeah. and breaking wood? Are you crazy? He said, you got a hammer, get a saw. You break the wood, what are you banging with the home? Now they call my mother, Mom. Mom sees you doing it, she's gonna think that you flipped your pits. <laughs> I went crazy. So I, and it was, uh, oh. And with the actor studio. I told yeah, you. Told you that crazy. <laughs> if you want to tell it again, it was good. Well, <laughs> I've got to tame the language. <laughs> That's all right, it's cable.
But you, you know, then you have a book coming out. We want to get a little bit of that. Yeah. That's what the title of the book, the Up from the Street, comes from. Up from the sidewalk. Up from the sidewalk. And the guy that got me off the street was Sammy Davis Jr. Really? Yeah. Uh, My mother had a, a a customer, and his name was Willie Bryant, and Willie was the mayor of Harlem. And I was standing on the street with my with Vinnie Charlie and a few others smoking. And he came over and he says, I just spoke to your mother. And she's worried about you. Now he wasn't really concerned about me as much as he was worried about my mom. He said, She wants me to keep an eye on you. And I'm gonna I'm she wants me to take you out. I hear the expression take, take me, me out. out. <laughs> <laughs> I said, whoa, whoa, wait. <laughs> but he knocked the cigarette out of my mouth. And I was going to throw a shot at him, and he had two guys. It looked like two mountains standing behind him. So I looked at these guys. So he said, we're going out tonight. Do you have a suit? I said, yeah, I got a suit. He said, I want you to wear your suit tonight, but take a bath first. I want to slap this guy. So I got, I got dressed. And he took me to Harlem, a little further up. And he took me to a place called Wells. And we had waffles and fried chicken. I was eating like I was going to lose my mind. I, I, I couldn't eat fast enough. I said, this, he says, you like the food? And I said, yeah. He said, when we come back here, after where I'm taking you, there's a package for you to take home to your mom. And he took me to the Apollo Theater. And it was a mob who Sammy Davis Jr. was appearing at the Apollo. He took me to Sammy's dressing room. And Sam looked at me and said, sit down. I sat there. And he said, uh, Mr. Bryant has been talking to me about you. You're either going to go to prison or you're going to die. I said, that's my choice. He said, that's it, the way you're going. Willie Bryant, Sammy, got me a job, a gig, with an old black orchestra uh, called Lucky Millinder. And I wound up working with them at the, the Teresa Hotel on 135th Street. Yeah. How <laughs> do you remember? Sure. Like, um, Chingery Robinson. Right. Yeah. That's where Castro stayed there. Oh. Then before it closed. Yes, <laughs> when they were cooking chickens. Right. <laughs> They, were, they had a barbecue in the middle of a room. Yeah. They ripped up the floorboards yeah. and they were made a bonfire. Yeah. So now, they get me this job. And I said, doing what? He said, you're going to be a band boy. I said, what's a band boy? You put out the charts for the band. You put out the seats, the charts, and after the show, put every ba everything back in the right books. And that's it. I said, oh, okay. Lucky came over to me and gave me 50 bucks at the end of the night. 50 bucks then? Wow. Oh, yeah. It was a massive amount of money. And I, he said, get yourself some new kicks, shoes. Right. So I said, I went from Tom McCann to Floorshine in one night. Actually, a lot of people, Floorshine was top of the line back then. It was $15 yeah. for the Floorshine yeah. shoes. So I gave wow. my mother 35 more money than she had earned all month. Yeah. God. And that's how it started for me. And, and 20 some odd years later, I was opening for Tony in Vegas at the Sands. And in the audience is Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Sam. And after that, well, Frank gave me a standing ovation. And when Frank stands up, the world stands, world stands up. up. So, and Sam came to me and he said, where do I know you from? And I said, you don't remember me? He said, no, you look familiar. I said, I'm the kid that you said is going to die or go to prison. And we both cried. Yeah, I'm going to say, he must have been really proud of you after that. He was. He really was. We became yeah. good friends. I spent a lot of time at huh. his house. And it's funny, but uh, after opening night, massive party. Because of Tony's opening night at the, at, you know, the Sands. Uh, going back though, Lucky Millinder, after the gig, they had a party. Uh. And the women were just piling in. 
And I, I'm heading to the party. <laughs> Lucky said, where are you going, my man? I said, the party. He said, uh-uh. I said, what do you mean, uh-uh? <laughs> I'm part of the band. He said, not that part. <laughs> he said, you think I'm what your mama getting on me? No, my man. Go home, baby. He said, your mama will kill me. <laughs> Now the funny thing is, soon after that, um, you know, with some friends up from the Bronx, and they decide they're gonna hire a lady of the evening. So my one of the guys got a car, he's 16 years old, he's, he's got a car. I'm in the car with him. I'm sitting in the front, and I don't know what they're doing. They go pick up this, this broad. She gets in the back, with the two other guys. And I hear, Henry? <laughs> oh, I told him, oh, it's from my, the, my building. I said, yes, ma'am. What you doing here? I said, well, I went for it. I'm gonna tell you, mom, you better get the hell out of this goddamn car. I said, yes, ma'am. I came out the car, I didn't know where the hell that was. I'm walking home. <laughs> So said, well, she tells my mom, I'm, a, I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> Henry? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> and you were 18, you said, when you did Car 54? Yeah, yeah. How did that come about? I was a cop. I was a cop for about a minute and a half. I took the test. I didn't know what to do with my life. But I knew if I became a cop, I'm not going to be like the cops that used to beat the hell out of me for no reason. With that nightstick. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That nightstick was a deadly weapon. There was the cops could take it and throw it and like half a block and bring you down. Yeah, they know how to use that stick. Yeah. They were more active with that that stick than they were with a gun. I'm serious. Yeah, really? Yeah. I mean, they kept you in line, but they I just, I swear, we were talking, I'm feeling a thing across my face. Yeah, yeah. I, I am too. <laughs> you remember I that? Remember it's the, a feeling that never leaves yeah. you. <laughs> they give you a beating just for looking at you. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 For what you, we didn't catch you doing. <laughs> so anyway, Bruce, uh, a couple of guys, are, there was a guy who was a comic, Mickey Deems. And his wife was Nat Hyken's secretary. Nat Hyken created Car 54. He created the Bilko show. Now, I knew that Bruce was going to be on the show. I had met Bruce when he was working downtown as a maitre d' and a waiter in one of the uh, yeah, nightclubs. Yeah. So I walk in. You're talking about Bruce Kirby now. Yeah. 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 So I walk in to meet Nat Hyken because Mickey said, Hank, they're doing a series that's about cops. He said, I think you've got a good shot. So I walk in, and there's God, Nat Hyken. And I'm scared. I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to act like. So I sit down, and he looks at me, and he says, you're Ed Nicholson. I said, no, 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 I'm Hank Garrett. <laughs> He says, it's just the kind of dummy I'm looking for. Ed Nicholson is the character I want you to play on the show. And Mickey and his wife are going, oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. That's how it happened. Then. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Joey, Joey Ross. <laughs> that line, boy. Oh, my God. Always remember that line. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> he was a burlesque comic. Yeah. And... His hygiene habits were <laughs> to be questioned. <laughs> we were doing a masquerade show. We're, we're going to a masquerade party, so each one has got a different costume on. And somebody said, what's Joey going on as? So somebody said, he put on clean underwear, nobody will recognize him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, he was a piece of work, boy. Oh. But a lot of those characters went on to do cartoons. You know, I get, and you did some of the cartoons, didn't you? Voiceovers? Yeah, I did uh, Garfield. Oh, Garfield. It still plays in the morning. Because yeah, I watch I the cartoons in the morning. <laughs> I do. I like. My kind of guy. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, I don't watch the news. I watch, you know, because at 9 o'clock, I watch that, then I watch the search. 
I like the Smurfs and the, oh, the, and the Road Runner. <laughs> well, I also did G.I. Joe. Oh, G.I. Joe. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were a little upscale for me. This one did. 